Lab two is going to cover significant digits, graphing, and density. So this PowerPoint slide is going to help you collect the data for the significant digits and density portion of the lab. The graphing portion of the lab will be a different video. So when you start lab two on page 13 of your lab manual, you will see the pre-lab for lab two. In the pre-lab, you will go through the pre-lab questions answering them with the amount of significant digits, doing rounding, and completing the scientific notation forms. On page 14, there are also a few questions with calculations and significant digits. What we're going to focus on is the procedure itself. So in part A, starting with the Lab 2 data sheet on page 15, you need to measure the length, width, and height of a wooden block. And we're going to do that using the following pictures. Now, all measurements are showing the centimeter side of the ruler. So the length, width, and height will be measured in centimeters. It's important to take significant figures into account. So when we are using measuring devices in lab, we need to use them correctly. We need to include all of the significant digits. This means going one past what the device allows. For example, if you have a ruler and it measures to 0.1 increments, so it goes to the 10th place, your measurement, what you write down, what you record, should go one further than that. So you shouldn't just go to the 10th place where the ruler goes, you should go to the hundredths. So you should be reporting to two decimal places for your length, your width and your height. So let's look at the first length. You can see in the top picture, I am showing block number three, the whole length of that block. In the bottom picture is a close up of the length. So you can see I'm using the centimeter side of the ruler and you can tell that the block is, I'm going to just say approximately 14.5. Well, for lab purposes, we don't want to be approximate. So we want to be a little bit more specific than that. So to do that, we're going to see exactly where that hits on the ruler. And for me, it looks like it's not quite at the 14.6, but it's not at 14.5 either. It's somewhere in between. So that's why you need to go one past what the device allows. So notice this ruler goes by tenths. 14.1, 14.2, 14.3, so on and so forth. So we want to go one past what the ruler allows. So if I think that it's between 14.5 and 14.6, I would record that by going out an extra decimal place. So if it's between, that means it's 14.5. How far between? If I think it's halfway between, I would write 14.55. If I think that it's closer to the 14.5, I might write 14.52. So this last digit is called the uncertain digit, and that digit is going to vary depending upon the person doing the measurement themselves. So you look and see what you think the measurement should be. Make sure you're going out to two decimal places and recording that last uncertain digit. Next, let's look at the height of the block. So once again, I have two pictures, one showing the total height, the next showing a close-up. So you can see that the height is nine point something. So 9.1, 9.2, somewhere in between. That's for you to decide. Just make sure that you are recording your height to two decimal places. Don't forget the units, centimeters. Last but not least, the width. So this one's a little bit easier to see, given the clear ruler <clears throat> spanning that small distance. So to me, it looks like the width is right at 1.9. So if you ever get it where it's not between 
two of the dashes, but it's right on one of the dashes. That's fine, but you still need to go out two decimal places to keep with the correct number of sig figs. So if it's exactly at the 1.9, don't just stop there, because we need two decimal places. So write 1.90. Maybe you're looking and you see a little sliver past, so you might write 1.91 or 1.92. Just make sure you are using the correct number of significant figures. Next, you need to calculate the volume of the block. So in order to calculate the volume of the block, you need to take the length times the width times the height. Make sure you're using the correct numbers of significant figures when reporting your answer. So since we are multiplying, you need to look at the significant figures as a whole. So count how many significant figures that you have in your length measurement, in your width measurement, and in your height measurement, and make sure to pick the smallest. For instance, if your width had three significant figures, your length had four, and your height also had three, you'd want to pick the smallest. So the smallest is three, so you'd report your answer to three significant figures. Also, remember your units. So length, width, and height were all measured in centimeters. So for the units, you're doing centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, which would give you centimeters cubed. So before we look at the rest of the data collection for the cylinder, let's talk a little bit more about the wooden block that we saw on the previous slides. So you'll notice after the wooden block, you need to take the volume that you get and convert it from centimeters cubed to inches cubed. Make sure that you are showing your setup and using the correct number of sig figs and including your units. The conversion factor is there for you. In number two on page 15, that doesn't need any data collection. It is just a question of conversions. So you are going to take that 350 inches cubed and convert it to feet cubed, and then again to centimeters cubed. Make sure you're showing your work, including sig figs and labeling with units. So now we're at number three, where we are going to take measurements of a cylinder. We are using a caliper instead of the plastic metric ruler described in the lab manual because it's going to be a little more accurate for this small cylinder. So with a caliper, when you're taking the measurements, you can see from the close-up, is that you're not going to take the measurements from this edge right here. So that's a common mistake. We don't want to take it from this edge. Instead, we're taking it from where this zero is. So you see this zero that I'm underlining here, and there's a dash above the zero. That's where we're taking the measurement from. Since it is a ruler, it goes to the tenths place. We always want to go one past what the device allows, so we are going to report the length of that cylinder to the hundredths place. So two decimal places once again. Next, let's look at the diameter. So the diameter is just the widest part of the circle of the cylinder. So I'm placing that inside the calipers. Looking at a close-up of this, remember we're looking from where this zero dash is. So it should be 2.2 something. So it's a little past that 2.2 mark. Make sure you're going out two decimal places and recording the units in centimeters. Now, to calculate the volume of a cylinder, we will be using the equation pi r squared L. So notice we have L for length, which we measured with the calipers. But then we have this r squared. And what that is, is the radius. So we didn't measure the radius. We measured the diameter. So to figure out what r is, we're going to take the diameter and divide it by 2. Because the radius is really just half of the diameter. Once you calculate the radius using the correct sig figs, 
you can plug it into this equation along with the length and pi. Since we are taking the radius squared, which would be centimeters squared, and the multiplied by the length, centimeters, we are still getting the units of centimeters cubed. Now we're also going to be calculating the density of this cylinder, but we won't be doing that until we get to page 17. So it's not shown on this same page. So before I get into the density of the cylinder, let's look at the questions. So one question asks you to calculate the volume, which we just described. The next one asks, what is the volume of the cylinder in milliliters? And what is the volume of the cylinder in meters cubed? So to help you figure this out, I'll give you a conversion factor. So it's helpful to know that one centimeter cubed is actually equal to one milliliter. That will help you with that first part. Going from centimeters cubed to meters cubed, you'll have to look up one of your metric to metric conversions and then make sure to cube it when you use it. Now I'm going to skip past page 16. That is the graphing exercise, and I will describe that and show you um, how to graph in a different video. So we're moving on to part C. Part C is talking about the density portion. So moving all the way down to part C, number one, determining the density of a cylinder using a ruler. So determine the mass of the cylinder used in section A. So you can't do that because you don't have the cylinder. So that's what this mass right here is. I took the cylinder, brought it over to a scale, and then wrote down how many grams that cylinder was. So you have the mass of the cylinder now and the volume of the cylinder you calculated by using this equation above. So you'll take both that mass and that volume and insert them in the density equation, where density is equal to mass divided by volume, to calculate the density. Make sure to show your calculations and use the appropriate significant figures. The next part of determining density is to determine the density of a metal bar by water displacement using a graduated cylinder. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use, instead of a metal bar, that same cylinder we just measured. So how do we do this? Well, we start with a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. We are then going to record the water level before we add the cylinder. So I added approximately 50 milliliters to this graduated cylinder. But I don't want you to be approximate. I want you to tell me exactly how many you see in that graduated cylinder. So remember, whatever device we're using, we're going to go one past what that device allows. So in this case, a graduated cylinder goes from 50 to 51 to 52, 53, 54, 55, so on and so forth, up to 60. So what I'm seeing is two sig figs. We need to go one further than that. So we're going to go to three sig figs. So that means you need to go out one decimal place when you record the volume in this 100 mil graduated cylinder. So the 50 mark is this white line that completely encircles the graduated cylinder. And you can see the water levels a little bit above. It's at the 51. In my opinion, it's exactly at the 51. But remember, since the graduated cylinder measures it to the 51 mark, we want to go one past that. So I would write 51.0, and I would write milliliters to make sure to include my units. What we do next is we add the cylinder. And what happens is the cylinder is more dense than the water. So the cylinder is going to sink to the bottom, thus displacing the water. When it does that, the water level, therefore, is going to rise and go up. So we're going to have a new water level, which we will record in the next blank. 
So the water level here, make sure we're reading at the meniscus. Meniscus means the center of the curve. So for a graduated cylinder, the water usually curves slightly down and then comes up on the edges. So we want to make sure that we're reading at the bottom of the curve and not at the edges. So it's a little above the 75 mark, and I'll leave that for you to decide just how much. Make sure you go out one decimal place. Here are the same pictures with a piece of paper behind it. So if you were having trouble seeing the water line, um, especially for the after, you can try to use these to see if that helps you see the water line a little bit better. Next, you need to calculate the displaced volume. So what is the volume change of the water? To do that, you will take your after volume, so after the cylinder was added, and subtract your before volume when it was just the water in the graduated cylinder. Doing that subtraction will give you the volume of the cylinder. I'm going to move on to page 18. And then you are going to calculate the density once again of the cylinder. Same equation, and you're going to use the mass that we had, that we used in the previous density, because we're still using the same cylinder, except for you're going to be using your new volume, the volume of the cylinder due to the water displacement. Now, these densities and volumes should be very similar to each other, but they're not going to be exactly the same. Next, we're going to determine the density of a rubber stopper using a graduated cylinder. So the reason we're doing it just with water displacement and not with the direct measurement method is because if you look at this rubber stopper, notice it's an irregular shape, right? It's going to be hard to take measurements of that and calculate the volume with a ruler. So how we're going to do this is just the water displacement method. So once again, I have approximately 50 mils of water. You will record that to one decimal place. The rubber stopper was then added. You can see it here at the bottom. Notice the water level rose. Close up of the water level off to the far right. Read it to one decimal place and record. Then do your subtraction to figure out what the volume of the stopper is and calculate the density. The mass of the stopper will be included in the notes of the PowerPoint. So I know it is not here, so look back to the original notes before you press play, and the mass will be in there. So I'll leave it to you to figure out why we can't use direct measurement method to determine the density of a rubber stopper. If you were listening, you'd be able to figure that rule out. Also think about if you try doing a cork. Think about densities when you answer that question. So that is all for the data collection portion of this lab. Um, look for another video to complete page 16, the graphing portion. Let me know if you have any questions.